Good evening and welcome to the January 9th, 2007 school board meeting. Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Um, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, yes, I have a couple that I would add. Uh, under superintendent's report, uh, there will be a D uh, that I would like to talk about as far as uh, future here. Uh, I think, oh yes, under D, under new business, number 11, would you please cross off that consideration of a letter from high school staff member regarding uh, retiring that has been set aside and so I'm going to ask you to cross it off for now and so that will not be in the discussions tonight and we'll also let the newspapers know that um, I think those are the only changes that I have at this point in time. okay anybody else actually we'll have an addition under new business That's right. okay a personnel matter thank you Anyone else? What's the new addition? Personnel matter. Oh, personnel. Okay. okay. Uh, moving along. Um, do I have a motion for the approval of the December school board minutes? So moved. Second? Rebecca? Any discussion? All in favor? Seven, zero. Um, Let's see, moving to comments by high school and middle school students. Uh, do we have the high school students here? Great. We have one high school student here. <laughs> okay. Um, could you come up? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, there's not actually uh, too much to talk about, which I think is a pretty good thing, which probably means things are going pretty smoothly. Um, but. One exciting thing, well, it wasn't that exciting, but I <laughs> but, uh, got some spirits high. Was uh, We gave out candy cane grams. Uh, students seemed to like that. And kids went around um, doing different songs and holiday carols to classes, kind of disrupting things, which is nice. And uh, um, I think the only other thing I could think of to maybe talk about would be uh, just recently, like kids may be concerned a little bit with um, the exact details of what Governor Baldacci proposed about something. I don't know, but <laughs> some Welcome kids would like to have that up. <laughs> And uh, I think that's about it. Is the high school forum tomorrow night? It is. And it is. Is there usually a topic that's just that's chosen, or is it just kind of a whatever's on people's minds? Um, it used to be uh, that we would plan it beforehand, but lately, just at the beginning of the meetings, we just discussed what people would like to talk about. It'd be great to have some school board members there. <laughs> There'll be um, two school board members there that I know of. Um, great. Linda and Trish will be there. Cool. Just Assuming we're going to talk about is the possibility of this of, uh, high school student government being on the school board in some capacity about that. The other thing that we talked about last month about talking about this month is different models of student government. Great. 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 Any other questions for Daly? Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Okay. Um, middle school students. Do we have anyone here from the middle school? Great. Can you come up? Well, first of all, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, of course, tomorrow is going to be a half day. Also, on January 26th, there's going to be a community dialogue day, and the student council is going to send around eight representatives, and I think that's going to be really interesting. The school store is, uh, again, going well, and soon we're going to be offering Cape Elizabeth-style clothing to all the students. And, uh, 
This month, we're starting to support the Nothing But Nets campaign, um, where we raise money to send mosquito nets to families in Africa to pro protect them sorry, from mosquitoes which carry the malaria virus. Oh, sorry, parasite. Each net will cost around $10, and we hope to raise around $750. Great. Thank you. Question. I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um, the Community Dialogue Day? Yes. Can you explain that a little bit more? That's, that's our day. Our 26. Day? Oh. District discussion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, the 7th and 8th grade girls basketball teams have their last game of the season on Thursday. Um, in observance of Martin Luther King Day, there is no school Monday, January 15th. Uh, there is a 5th and 6th grade social at Vacation Land Bowling Friday, December 15th. And most who attended said that they had a great time. And personally, I thought it, the social was a success. The spring musical will be called Into the Woods. And auditions will be February 5th and 6th from 2.30 to 4.30. Sign-ups will be posted outside the middle school office in the last week of January. That's it. Thank you. Thank Any you. questions? Any questions? No, thank, you. thank you very much. I understand Rosie just came in. Did you want to add anything? <laughs> <laughs> we sort of already went by your part, but if you'd like to come up and say something. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, communications. Alan? Uh, yes. Uh, the first thing I have is talking about the SAT report. I think you'll remember last month I mentioned it had come in, and Jeff sent some questions back that needed to be talked about. And so Jeff is going to give a brief uh, overview of the SAT tonight. And I, I do actually have pictures of all these for the board members I will give to you. Um, I didn't have them ready in time to put in the packet, and since I didn't have that, I figured I'd capture everybody's attention by putting them out there, and then you can have them for reference. But just so you know that you don't have to copy them. I just wanted to add one thing to what Daly mentioned about the uh, candy canes before I begin about SATs, because I think in many ways candy canes were more of an impact in terms of kids' lives <laughs> uh, just before the holiday break. Then uh, That was a National Hon National Honor Society fundraiser to support the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Um, and the kids managed to, they figured they'd give away 100 candy canes, I think, um, with various holiday songs of students' choice, both Christian, non-Christian, um, Jewish, I mean, all, all kinds of things. Um, and they ended up giving away about 400 candy canes and doing it so efficiently that it was over and done with within about 15 minutes of class. So it really was actually minimally disruptive and incredibly well organized, and it was a lot of fun. <coughs> um, this, I have just a few slides to sort of summarize um, the SAT results uh, for this year. Those recently came back. As you remember, this is, this is results of, based on the performance of our seniors this year, the class of two, uh, 2007, when they were juniors last spring, taking these in March. I want to mention just a couple things specifically first. Um, first of all, um, what you won't see here in anything that I give to you is anything that is specifically instructionally useful in the sense that it says, our kids are good in this aspect of writing, but they're not good in this aspect of writing. They're good in this aspect of math, but not this aspect of math, because to be honest with you, I was disappointed when the re results came back. Um, I expected with all the time between March and December that there might be some instructionally useful information in the reports in that sense. There is not. Um, in fact, there is less, less detail about that kind of information than even in the old MEA reports. On the other hand, I think you'll see that this, the, the numbers here do raise some interesting questions, um, and, and so, they, so I think they're worthwhile. 
At the top, what I've done is just, just a quick summary of Cape Elizabeth High School's results um, against the state average. So you'll see the state averages in the left-hand column. Um, and then I've got, for example, reading average is 443. Uh, the cutoff figure that the state used that was the cutoff between partially meets and meets is in that second column. So, for example, in reading it was 460. Um, Cape Elizabeth High School students as a whole scored 544. I've also put in, only because, it, um, <clears throat> because it, the, the questions get raised every now and then about special ed students, so it's important for people to understand that. It's also important because that column, ironically, is the one that has, can potentially have an impact on AYP. We have not gotten the AYP information, AYP determinations from the state, but AYP, by the way, is an acronym under No Child Left Behind about whether a school is a so-called failing school. Um, but I do want to just sort of footnote the right-hand column. We have an unusually small number of special ed students in the senior class this year. There are only seven students whose numbers are reflected there. Um, and so what typically happened in those categories is a couple of students scored really poorly. Like in writing, for example, there were two students who scored a 200, which is, means they didn't do anything. Um, and the rest of the students were considerably higher than that number. It's sort of the misleading aspect of averages, particularly when you're talking about really small numbers. Um, then going to the next row down, that's percent exceeds. In other words, 7% of the state on the reading, reading test exceeded the, the, um, a certain number, at the, a cutoff score that was determined for that. I didn't write that number in. Um, for us, it was 23%. And then the next category is lumping together the kids under the percent who partially meet, which is PM, and DNM, which is do, does not meet, did not meet. That's 56% for the state and 20% and for Cape Elizabeth High School students. So you'll see similarly, the math average was 444, we were 560. Um, writing average was 435, we were 549. One of the things that happened in the SATs, and it, and it didn't, wasn't a surprise to us at all, is that many schools came into last spring with a lot of trepidation about the switch from the MEAs to the SATs. We actually had less trepidation than many other schools because historically the vast majority of our students have taken the SATs, have always taken the SATs and taken them seriously anyway. So they, they do take them seriously, which in my mind is a, is a reason why they're a more legitimate indicator of the performance of our school system than the MEAs perhaps were. Um, but these numbers that you see in the blue column there are lower than our numbers have been um, for the last several years, not significantly lower. And our drop-off was considerably less than most other schools experienced because we only had a small percentage of kids who took the SATs last spring who would not have taken it but for the fact that the state required them to do it. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so these are the results overall. These is just a bar graph that shows by the different categories um, of how our students performed. Um, so you can just get a, a quick pictorial of um, our exceeds and meets, which obviously is far in excess of the partially meets or does not meet. I actually want to go back to the last slide for just a second and make a comment. <clears throat> if you look in the, in the column that says meets cutoff, one of the things that's pretty clear is that in the transition from the MEAs to the SATs, the standard, the cutoff, has been significantly lowered than it used to be with the MEAs. I remember uh, last year I did an analysis with Roger Rio, who's one of the teachers in the math department, and we took the SATs for our just graduated class of seniors last year, and we took um, the MEA scores that those students had, got, had scored as well, and we sort of matched up the, part, the different categories of meets, partially meets, and exceeds, and we sort of did a projection, even though you can't do it apples to apples because it's really different tests to try to get a sense of um, what score based on the cutoff that the um, State Department was using on the MEAs would, would students have to get to on the SATs in order to actually meet the standard. And our projection was in math, for example, that's the one we were focusing on because I was working with math teachers about it. We projected based on the standard that they were using at that time that the math cutoff would actually be about 550. And you can see here it's about 90 points below. So that's not a, a factoid that you see a lot in the newspapers, but it's a factoid to sort of put this into perspective in terms of 
the change, um, if there has been a significant, I, I, I believe, a significant lowering of the standard. Okay, this is the one you've seen. Um, then we went through, and this slide shows you the top 10 schools overall who have in excess of 37 or more students in their student body who took it, because I wanted to put in 37 so we got the main school of science and mathematics in there. Um, because it's a small school, it's a selective school, it's a test, you test into that school. And you can see over in the right hand column is the combined score and you can see that we are the top public school um, in, in the state of Maine. Um, second only to the main school of science and mathematics. Um, John Babst, for those of you who are not familiar with John Babst, that's a parochial school in Bangor. It's comparable to Chevrus. I've had a number of people since we showed this slide to, the, to some teachers last week ask me why isn't Chevrus in there and the reason is because they don't report. Um, their kids undoubtedly take the SATs but they don't participate in the way that John Babst elects to participate. I don't know why but that's, that's why um, Chevrus is missing. These are the top 10 schools in math, um, and you'll see again we're at the top, um, just again behind the main school of science and mathematics, which is considerably ahead of us, um, understandably, because that's the way the kids take test in based on their science and math abilities and interests. So we are the number one public school as far as that goes. In reading, you see we're John Babs sneaks ahead of us. We remain in the position of number one um, in terms of public schools. Um, and then you see the, the schools that are below us. These are the top ten schools um, in the state. Writing, um, Yarmouth High School sneaks ahead of us by a considerable amount, and I want to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but Yarmouth High School has, for the last several years, both on the MEAs and the SATs, um, done, done very, very well with their students on the writing assessment. And I'll address that in a little bit as well uh, in terms of their, their performance on that because it's very intriguing to me. Okay, this to me is the most interesting analysis. Um, and it, so Roger Rio, who's a math teacher who teaches statistics and just loves this stuff, um, helped me gather these statistics. And I gathered the numbers in the right-hand side, which are the median, in, median, income, median household income for 1999, which is the latest date that I could find comparison figures for. Um, the reason why there's nothing there next to Maine School of Science and Mathematics and John Babst is because we don't have that information. They don't come from communities. They draw from a whole lot of different places. But you see the numbers. Um, we are, Cape Elizabeth is the top um, on average median household income in the state um, and we were curious about is there what is the relationship between income and scores on the SAT and this next graph will show you that. And I'm going to come back to this one in a second and point out one school in particular. All right, what this graph shows is um, and again this is Roger Rio, um, all I'm doing is taking his work, full credit to him, uh, he's a fantastic resource for people who love to crunch numbers. Um, this shows um, the combined score of all the three tests, reading, writing, and math on the SAT on the y-axis, and then the income along the x-axis <clears throat> with all the data um, about median income and scores. And then what Roger's done is he's <clears throat> drawn or had a computer draw a line of best fit, which is a line that on average, that's not probably technically the right word to use, but on average represents the relationship between income and SAT scores. Um, and the numbers down below, I wanted to mention that because I, I um, um, because Roger would want me to. Um, <laughs> for those of you who are familiar with the concept of correlation in blue down there, that's that, num that first number shows uh, the correlation, which is 0.75, which Roger says is a pretty significant number. Um, the more significant number he has told me, and I forget what it's called, but it's that R squared number right there down in the, down in the line below, which is 0 0.57. And the way Roger explains that to me is that that represent, means that 57% um, of the variation in the SAT scores can be explained by the variation in income. 43% um, cannot be explained by variation in income. Um, and, and, and that's determined by this line of best fit. Did I get that more or less right? Is that fair? Okay, we got three math teachers here. I'm a little bit nervous about how this goes. Um, 
so you'll want to know where Cape Elizabeth is, um, and I didn't bring my pointer, but if you follow right along, it's pretty easy to find Cape Elizabeth because we are the mo we have the highest median household income, so we are the last school on the right. Um, the good news is we are significantly above the line, which means that we sort of, in layman's terms, we sort of outperform what would be predicted based on our income, um, which I think is really good. I was actually fearful when I did this that we would be below, but we outperform um, what would be predicted based on income, which is great. I am particularly interested in two schools, um, and the significant, the significant dimension here is the space, the vertical space between any given dot and the line of best fit, because that's sort of a rough measure of how much, how much a particular school outperforms its income or underperforms if you're unlucky enough to be on the bottom side. Um, and if you sort of follow along, there's one dot that is at about $58,000 in income, and that is Yarmouth High School. And that largely reflects their outstanding results on the writing assessment. Um, we're significantly above them on both reading and math, but that reflects their writing assessment. So um, I actually called Ted Hall, who's the uh, principal at Yarmouth, and they have done that. Yarmouth has, has historically been at the top of the state in terms of writing um, for a number of years. Um, we've been very, very close, but they've been at the top. So I called Ted Hall, and we're actually going to be taking a little pilgrimage over to Yarmouth High School to take a look at what they do in their writing program because it gets really good results. And he said, if, we're, if you're going to do that, how about if we send a group of people down to Cape Elizabeth to take a look at your math program because their results um, um, trail ours significantly. The other school, if you go down, there's one other school that's sort of... Will you have the hand pointed out? Yeah. What? I don't think so. No, no, no. no, no. no. <laughs> Um, if you go just below $30,000 and, uh, and, and follow all the way up, you find a, a, a school that is significantly high. You got me to go um, up Yes, there. why don't you do that? Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Our own family, right? Who needs pointers? Um, that school, in my mind, and I am not, I'm, not, I'm not receiving a fee from, a fee from this particular school district, to, uh, but if I were their public relations person, I would say to, to anybody, that that is perhaps the top performing in the school district in the state compared to their income. And that, interestingly, is Bangor High School. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go back to this, Bangor High School scores in the top 10 in every category. Um, I, think, oh, I guess they're, just, they're actually just below in writing. But there you see them in ninth place on reading. And there you see them in eighth place on math. And here, is their income down at the ninth position right there, which is 29,740, which we are two and a half times that. So that is an incredible performance, and Bangor has historically been there on both the MEAs and the SATs. Um, and I spoke to Norris Nickerson um, last week when we got these numbers and took a look at this line and that sort of thing, and, I ha and the superintendent of Bangor and I are playing phone tag with one another, and we are going to be doing a little trip up there as well to see what Bangor is doing, because they get outstanding results considering the nature of their community. It's absolutely phenomenal what they do. Um, so that's the question that it raises for us instructionally. We're obviously very pleased. Um, our, our kids are wonderful performing kids. They're at the top of the state. Um, uh, that's, that's a tribute to their work, their parents' work, um, and the work of teachers K through 12 um, um, in, in Cape Elizabeth. But that doesn't mean that we don't have something to learn from what other districts are doing where they have particular strengths, and that's what we intend to do. So that's it. Yeah. Any questions? Can we get this on paper? Oh, yes. Actually, I'm sorry. Yes, I do have it. For those of us who love numbers. Next report is on the seventh and eighth grade career fair. Uh, Steve, I just saw you come in. Do you want to just mention briefly the seventh and eighth grade uh, career fair? I know you've done it for several years, but what that entails? I say Jeff, I met Steve. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, 
seventh and eighth grade career fair has probably been going on for seven or eight years, I would guess. I think they started that just after my last stop here in Cape Elizabeth, prior to <laughs> a new one. And uh, what that is is uh, Gail Schmader, who's a, the volunteer coordinator for the district. She works closely with Rick Madden and this year also with uh, Kim Sturgeon. They have uh, a lineup of people from different uh, backgrounds, whether it's uh, somebody in law, somebody who's a chef, whether it's interior design, fashion. Um, there's, there's a whole host of topics that people are prepared to present on. So we draw from the, the local community for these professional positions. People, uh, the students in the school sign up for, they, they pick uh, the top three to five and then uh, things that they'd like to see and then we guarantee them that some, at least something off their list will be um, one of the pieces that they rotate through in, during the career fair. Um, they usually, Gail works very hard on this, typically gets at least two of their their favorites in, sometimes three. Um, <clears throat> some of the things, we have uh, professional athletes who come in as well, so some of them are, are really big hits, and, and uh, the people who come in, though, have been doing, some of these folks have been doing it right since the start. They come back every year, can't wait to do it, they love working with the kids. Um, we have uh, uh, a breakfast that we serve to start off with in a, in a warm up. The whole thing is very well orchestrated. We have uh, people from the, the parents from the school who um, uh, take, the uh, take the volunteers around to the locations that they need to be in, that provide the materials that are there during the presentations to do, run any errands and so forth for them. And there's also a classroom teacher there in each of the, each of the classrooms at the time. So, um, and then we do afterwards with the, during the advisory, we do debriefs and there, there's a survey the kids do and talk about what they see in careers and, and uh, how, they, how they felt about the career fair. Um, Rick Madden keeps meticulous records and so he, he's able to pull out for me. For instance, last year, came and he said, okay, Steve, here's the green, the green ones. This is every kid in the eighth grade. This is what they said. Here's the, here's the pink forms. This is what every kid in the, in the seventh grade said. And, and I could read till my heart's content on uh, what students thought of it. It receives rave reviews from the kids. So it's a very popular event. Thank you. Hmm? And the next one is Pond Cove Visitation. And Tom and Becky, I don't know if you want to report on that briefly. I just want to take a little of your time to offer an explanation and maybe answer a few questions about the letter I think you've already received in the mail inviting you to visit Pond Cove next Wednesday. Um, I know you've already had experience with the school as parents or volunteers or been involved in an activity, but the thinking in our part was you could come and spend the day or part of the day, whichever time you can spend, to see us actually at work. No special occasion, no special events that day. Uh, we'd like you to see as much as possible collectively from what happens we think every day with reading, writing, arithmetic, instructional support, reading recovery, music, math, you name it. So um, our purpose was to give you a view, a slice of life for one day at Pond Cove. We, uh, we hope that we, you as uh, educational directors here and policy makers that will give you a better sense of what life is like at Pond Cove and ground you a little more and overall give you just a little different perspective. We've also, in case you didn't know, extended this same invitation to town council members and we've heard back from quite a few of them. So whatever time you could spare would be great. I also want to give full credit to this idea to Shari Robinson and Becky Swift who came up with it. Not only the idea but the uh, structure behind it. Any questions? I just would like to comment that I think it is a wonderful idea and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to do it in the high school and the middle school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure it's, nope. they'll be thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> Hope to see you there. Thank you, Tom. The next one is on Harvard DataWise and I'm going to ask Shari to speak to that. This is a, a really special project that Shari is uh, really taking a star role in, and I truly appreciate it. I'm really in trouble tonight, aren't I? <laughs> Blame for everything. Um, the day, we talked to you about DataWise um, earlier, and that's a book that, that 
um, we're, uh, the team of us are using. Um, and uh, we met editors of that book at Harvard um, at Project Blueprints several days. And we stayed connected with several students at Harvard, um, as well as one of the editors of DataWise. And as we were emailing back and forth, we learned that there's a second book coming out. <clears throat> and the second book will be a compilation of case studies of schools that are implementing the DataWise process. Um, we were asked if uh, we would host a gentleman named David Ronka, who um, is assigned to write one of the chapters, and um, if we would have him come visit us for a while. He came on Tuesday and spent the day interviewing everyone on the team and also attended a team meeting. Um, and he has taken that information back, and we are hopeful that Cape Elizabeth would be one of the published case studies in the next book. <coughs> and. Um, we have been assured that we have reading rights before anything's published, so we can go through everything that's written um, that he writes. Um, but I, we also have a good relationship with him, and I'm sure we'll, that will not be a problem. But um, we were excited about it because the process is giving us a chance to reflect on how this implementation is occurring. It's giving us a chance to have that feedback from experts um, in the field. And also, we're quite excited because it's a way for us to add to the professional knowledge about how data is used in public schools in the United States. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So, we're quite excited about the project and certainly hope that this continues to go forward. And I just want to thank Charity again for all the work she's been doing to get this put together. Uh, my last one on here is Seif Grant's report. Uh, as you know, Seif is a very uh, instrumental in doing many things to support classrooms. There are three recent grants that have been given. And I just got information from it, so I'd just like to report on them briefly. The first one is uh, one that Tom Lazat received, who is the band director at the high school. Uh, his SEAF grant will allow them to purchase Band in a Box, which is a computer program that is designed to strengthen students' jazz improv improvisational skills. Students can punch in chords, changes in whatever tempo is comfortable. The grant will purchase the software and a computer and they will wire it in the band room so that the program can be piped through the speakers to the entire school. <laughs> you didn't say to the entire school, but I'm assuming. <laughs> uh, the second one, uh, Lisa Melanson, who is in the um, English department and also in the Achievement Center, received a grant uh, to pay tuition and part of her room expenses to attend the Harvard Graduate School of Education's Project Zero Summer Institute. Uh, many of us have heard of Project Zero and the work they're doing, and she's going to take advantage of the work that they're providing to work on fundamental questions and components of effective education. The third one was for Morgan Burns, who is at Pond Cove, and she received one for therapeutic horseback riding to foster skills development in students with special needs. And this program is focused on six students at Pond Cove Elementary School in their life skills program, and will give them the opportunity to participate and eight therapeutic horseback riding lessons during school hours at riding to the top therapeutic horseback riding center located in Wyndham and New Gloucester. So these are three of the most recent grants. Uh, I think it's very important for you as a board to know what CEF is doing with our staff. Uh, I know there are more grant proposals that will be coming in. and They're also looking at two major grants right now, which they'll provide more information later on. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Um, next, we come to comments from the public on non-agenda items. Is there anyone from the public? No? Seeing none? We'll move on to recognition. Um, we have quite a few recognition uh, pieces this evening, so I will read down through them. Um, there's about three pages, so I will get started. Thank you to um, Jeff for providing most of this information. First of all, um, in skating, Reese Ainsworth will be competing the week of January 19th at the National Figure Skating Competition. Una Donegan in grade nine and her skating partner just won the Junior International Ice Dancing Competition. Her skating coach was her sister, Fiona Donegan, who is soon to be qualified to be a nationally certified ice skating coach. Fiona also won this event in 2004. Athletics, Stannis Moody Roberts and Emily Atwood all state in cross country, and John Hayes, all state in golf. golf excuse me. 
In music, um, the Maine Association of Teachers of Singing Musical Theater Competition in lower high school grades 9 and 10, Sarah Friedman took second place. In upper high school grade 11 and 12, Jenny Myers took third place. In all national choir, Lauren Yokobaskis will be performing in Miami, Florida. In all state musicians, in jazz band, Jeff Witherell, Parker Marvin, and Dylan Sherry. In choir, Lauren Yokobaskis, Timothy Williamson. In concert band, Steve Friesel, Kate Taycash, Jeff Ayers, and Michael Katsos. Um, again, in all state musicians, continuing in orchestra, Katie Yoshua was the top scorer in the state for flute. Jeff Witherell, Liam Sullivan, Stephanie House, Kate Mitchell, Tess Wiggins, and Laura Hayes. In District 1 Honors Festival Musicians for Mixed Choir, Lauren Yokobaskis, Katie Yoshua, Claire Stack, Seth Richardson, Colin Whiteman, and Timothy Williamson. In Treble Choir, Laura Katsos, Jenny Myers, Kendall Cooper, Stephanie House, Bridget Walsh, and Bethany O'Meara. In orchestra, Kate Mitchell. In concert band, Mike Wilson, Will Dennison, Steve Friesel, Kate Takash, and Meredith Sells. In jazz band, Parker Marvin, Jeff Witherell, Jeff Ayers, Dylan Sherry, Michael, and Michael Katzos. For visual arts awards in Maine Scholastic Arts Competition, Ashel Gregory uh, received two Gold Key Awards, one for a portrait of Reese Ainsworth titled Reese. This was also awarded an American Visions nomination. The second gold was awarded to her art portfolio, a digital record of eight pieces completed over the past year in my, my classes, in, in her classes. <laughs> um, Chloe Brown received two Gold Key Awards, one for a self-portrait assemblage and one for a ceramic sculpture. Tucker Emerson received one Gold Key Award for a black and white photograph titled Hero. Rusty Leonard received one Silver Key Award for a photography portfolio. Ben Salerno received one Silver Key Award for an art portfolio. Megan Miklavik received one Silver Key Award for a graph graphite skeletal drawing. Adam Stephanus, a merit award for his art portfolio. All key, Gold Key Awards awarded work travels to New York to be judged nationally. And all work is on display at um, MECA, in Mecca, thank you, until January 27th, at which time there is a closing reception and award ceremony at Merrill Auditorium. And there is a um, teacher recognition for Suzanne Janelle, and she has been nominated as an American Council of Teachers of Foreign Languages Teacher of the Year. So congratulations to all those folks. Okay, superintendent's report. You have before you a document on lovely green paper, just so it stands out from all of the rest. This is the uh, budget schedule for 2007-2008 for presenting the budget. Uh, I'll go down through it briefly just to mention some of the points on it. Uh, the first one is January 23rd, 2007. It's a Tuesday at 7 p.m. There will be a budget workshop at the high school library. I will put beside that that, that there is, should be a question mark beside that, and I'll explain that in just a few minutes. The next one will be February 27th, and that will be at 7 p.m. in the high school library, and that is when our uh, DLT members will start to present their budgets for the 2007-2008 uh, school year. March 3rd is a Saturday. And we'll also meet from 8.30 to 2.15 to figure, finish up those reports and to go over any public comments. March 13th, 2007 will be the school board meeting to look at the budget and do final approval. Uh, we always remember that there may have to be some other meetings in there based on what some of the issues may be. April 12, 2007 is a Thursday, and that is when the school board has recommended budget is delivered to the town council. On April 20, let me go backwards for that for just a minute. One of the questions has been whether we deliver that to the town council early or deliver it on the day that we do the presentation on it. Uh, 
this, there has been some discussion about the possibility of not doing it until uh, it goes to the town council. The issue that I've discussed with the town manager is that this is something that has traditionally been done and really needs to stay there unless the board decides to uh, make a different decision on it. So that is why that is on here at this point. It is followed on April 25th, a Wednesday at 7.30, uh, with a review of the school budget by the chair of the school uh, finance committee. On May 7th, uh, there is a public hearing on the proposed budget, and on May 14th or 21st, uh, there will be a town council budget adoption. Uh, the next page that you have just goes down through the people who will present on February 27th and March 3rd. Uh, this is the planned agenda, and I will speak to the January 23rd issue in just a few minutes. Uh, Alan, may I ask a question? Yes. The April 12th, is yes. that the evening where the presentation is made, or is that when the document That's is? That's when the document would be transferred, and then the evening would be the 25th. Okay. Um, so may I address this issue? Yeah, point? sure. Yep. Okay. Um, last, this past fall, um, Elaine Maloney, who was the sitting chair at that time, and myself when I was um, finance chair for that board, met with the town council chair and finance committee chair to discuss a number of items, and one of which was um, the timeline of the budget process. And we had discussed um, some concerns that um, we had as a board um, regarding the timeline. The concerns are as follows, that um, when we present the document on paper on April 12th, there follows a number of weeks where we are in receipt of questions from the town council and we endeavor to the best that we can to answer those questions. Uh, by the time April 25th arrives, when we actually physically present the budget to the town council, there really remains no questions, no dialogue. Um, and in my mind, it raises a question as to why we are working so hard on an an actual visual presentation on a budget when there doesn't seem to be a lot of real purpose for that. So I was wondering if um, the board would be interested in Kathy and I continuing this conversation with the town council chair and finance chair to see if there may be a, a, another way that we can approach this process. Did you want to make a motion or? I'm not sure we need to, because we're not actually, I don't think we can actually decide when we present a document to the town council. I believe that's the town council's decision. Um, but what I would like to ask is maybe if we can get a, a sense of the board as to whether you think that this is worth pursuing with them um, and, and having a, a discussion. Okay. Does anybody want to pipe in then? I'd make a comment that I think sure. that any dialogue with the council um, is worth having. However, I'd like to know what's being discussed before it's discussed, um, simply because I, I, I've had no feedback on, on prior meetings, and I don't know whether that's true of everybody else. Um, so again, I support the concept, uh, I support a conversation based on the fact that conversation and dialogue with the council is good. Um, but I, as a board member, would like to know what's going on before it happens. Okay. Anybody else? Um, oh, oh, go ahead. I'm just trying to understand some of your concerns. Um, we do have a two-week time span here between when we present the document to the town council and before we make our presentation. Rather than changing dates or the presentation of the document, why not hold their questions, ask them to give them the time to review the document, because it is lengthy. Um, they always do have questions, and rather trying to answer the questions ahead of time, have them hold their questions until our presentation, because a lot of their questions would be answered through our presentation. You know, yeah. to save us the time and, you know, rather than trying to answer these questions. Plus, any questions they may have, the public should hear as well. 
Right. Um, and I think the more open that we conduct business and their questions about the budget, the better we can answer them in a, in a public forum. Right. You know, rather than, rather than changing the schedule, right. maybe. Yeah. I'm not saying necessarily we change right. dates, but I think what you just suggested is kind of the, the thinking, the process of, okay. of, of looking at this and, and refining it, perhaps. Um, I think that would be very useful. And in fact, what I would, what I would suggest is um, if you're in agreement to just think about some of the ideas that you have for this and maybe forward them to Kathy and, and myself. Um, and um, I actually did talk about the meeting that we had with them. And maybe you'll remember we discussed also the, the idea of um, a joint town council school board effort on alternative energy. Um, and we also had preliminary discussions about what we were going to do if Tabor passed. So there were other items um, that were discussed at that meeting, and I did report them um, as part of the, I think, the Finance Committee report. And I would do the same again. Okay. Trish, you had a question? No, I think Linda's idea, I support continued dialogue and really making the presentation, the questions be answered in the, at the presentation so the decision so that decisions aren't made prior to hearing the information at the public presentation. Right. Right. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, very briefly, we uh, are having a sports done right uh, program coming up in late January. Uh, Sue, would you want to just mention briefly about sports done right? Uh, it's going to be held on January 18th at 7 p.m. at the community center. Um, representatives from the Sports Done Right Council will be coming down and meeting with school board members, um, administrators, athletic administrators. Uh, we've also extended invitations to Little League, uh, Casco Bay Hockey, Casco Bay Soccer, and Cape Elizabeth Football. Um, I would like to have some indication as to how many so I can let them know um, how many materials to bring with them. Um, this is not the public forum. I think um, should we move ahead that will be announced and will come later on. But certainly anyone in the public really wanting to, to come that evening would welcome that. I am going to make a request. The next report could be fairly long because of discussion about what's going on in the governor's proposal and everything else. I know I have three people from the high school who are waiting, and one of them has a daughter with her. I'm sure they'd like to get home. <laughs> so what I would like to suggest is that we move the update on the MSSA legislation committee uh, to after the high school report and give them an opportunity to report. And then I also have a D, which is added to that, that I would do at that point. If that's uh, with permission of the board. Mm -hmm. Most certainly. Okay. Yep. So shall I have, can I have Jaff introduce his people and the work that they're going to do with us tonight? It, it's purely coincidence, actually, that I just did the SAT report. Now I'm introducing the math teachers who I think are largely responsible among, among the group. Uh, for the fact that five of the past six years, um, Cape Elizabeth High School students have been number one in the state in math. Um, we have a, a, a excellent math program, K through 12. It's linked, it's coherent, it makes sense, regardless of whether you like it or dislike it. There are some real advantages to having some common language the kids begin to hear that weaves through K through 12. And by the way, these very brief preliminary comments can't count against their 15 minutes, because I promised them. <laughs> okay. Um, the second thing I would say is um, the particular focus when I talked to Elaine Brownell about this um, presentation, the thing that got me thinking about it is the work that's happened with the Achievement Center and really several years ago Charlotte Hanna, who's one of the presenters, came forward with an idea um, that eventually got translated in, in the high school into MLR Math, which is a course that students who most struggle with math take in addition to their other math, their core math class, um, usually in grade nine. I think now exclusively in grade nine. Um, and so what really did, there's a lot of lip service paid um, and a lot of 
educational journals and that sort of thing about the way to respond to kids who struggle is not to lower the standard, which is a very typical response, but to increase the amount of time and change the instructional approaches that you use with students. And really, that, that program got that off the ground, I think, in a very practical way in Cape Elizabeth High School. Another element of that has been the, Cape, has been the Achievement Center that the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation made possible and that Elaine works in. So this is Charlotte Hanna and Elaine Brownell and Courtney Farrell. Um, and I told you that um, according to our best fit line, and they will appreciate this, that 57% of the variation in, in scores from income is due to income. <laughs> The other 50 percent, the other 43 percent is these folks right here and their colleagues um, K through 12 that they represent. So we have an outstanding math department. I'm glad to have you here from some of them. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. We're really getting inundated with mathematics tonight. I'm sorry Roger couldn't have been here as well. He would have enjoyed this thoroughly. Um, the three of us are not known for our brevity. Um, <laughs> but we've been practicing for the 15 minutes, so we're, we're ready to go. Um, we would like to thank you for the opportunity that you're giving us tonight to uh, share with you a few specific uh, programs that we deem or are deeming successful at the high school at this particular time. And they are particularly with our incoming or with our freshmen. Um, to give you a little history, four years ago, our incoming ninth graders, especially those who struggled in math, were assigned to a course called pre-algebra slash tutorial. That was their first experience in the high school with a mathematics course. With the onslaught of the main learning results, however, it was evident that these particular students would not finish high school with the necessary instruction to meet standards. That is, finish courses through advanced algebra. They would be taking this pre-algebra tutorial as a freshman. They would then go on to Algebra Part 1 as a sophomore, and then Algebra Part 2 as a junior, and then finish with geometry, which would leave them shy of information that was very valuable in the advanced algebra course. Also, all the information went through that was required by MLR standards, and for those students seeking a college experience, certainly the SATs. So they were going to be short and coming up short with the way the program was. It was clear to the department at that time that a change was needed. And we all know that a change, especially for these young people who do not have a lot of confidence in math, had to come with a great deal of, of support to be successful. Our response to this situation included, most importantly, a requirement that all ninth grade students, unless assigned to a math course through special ed, would enroll in an algebra class. Either an algebra part one, which would be over two years, part one and part two, or a CP algebra, which would thus eliminate the pre-algebra tutorial. To do this, however, we needed an additional support system, not only to help fill the holes, but to boost the confidence of those students who would probably not choose math in the middle of a lineup if they could choose their most favorite subject. The students in Algebra Part 1 would be supported by an additional remedial course entitled Aptly MLR for Main Learning Results. We had nothing else to call it at that time. We were so excited about everything that we gave it the name of Main Learning Results. Uh, the CP kids, in, in addition, would also be supported now by an aligned offering to our curriculum from the Plato software in the Achievement Center, which has been a boon to our math department, um, especially in the algebra area. The geometry is not as inclusive, but the algebra has been terrific, especially for the kids that are in the CP algebra course. We're very pleased with the response to this program and, most importantly, with the success of our students to this point. Charlotte's going to talk to you a little bit about particulars, and then Courtney's going to wrap it up so that we do our 15-minute program. But thank you. Thank you. I'm Charlotte Hanna. And five years ago, I was teaching math both at the middle school and at the high school. And as a teacher in both places, I was very much aware of score results on MEAs in both the eighth grade and at the high school. 
and I became gravely concerned that there were about 15% of our eighth graders who, based on their performance in their first eight years in Cape Elizabeth, uh, were not going to meet standards at a high enough level that they would be able to graduate. Because at that time, graduation looked as though it was going to be dependent upon meeting the standards. That sense has changed, and we don't know how that will evolve. But that was the incentive for me to start researching and trying to find a way that we could do things dif differently. So I was uh, talking to teachers throughout the state and found nothing that other schools had figured out to do to help these kids. And I started checking on the internet and checking different programs. And I came across a commercially available program that looked to me, based on their research and their numbers, that might be a profitable thing for us to undertake. But it was expensive. That was the first year that CIF was in, in uh, in progress and I was in the first group of applicants for grants and my grant was approved so I received the funding that I needed to buy into this program learn how to use the program and I piloted the program that first year in a non-algebra class the class that Elaine described as a, a course for students that generally were not entering into our Chicago math program but were uh, performing at a lower standard than even the algebra program within uh, Chicago math. Some of them would take tutorial for two or three years at a time trying to hone some skills but never getting up to high school level mathematics. After the first year piloting it with success with those students, uh, we decided as a department that I would propose to Jeff that we change that program into an additional math class for mostly freshmen at that time to take in addition to an algebra part one such that freshman year they'd take Algebra Part 1 and MLR Math. The MLR Math would serve two functions to support their Algebra program and also to fill in gaps that they had from their middle school or elementary school math experience. So we did that for the first year and found great success in it. It's interesting that the students who are in that program that first, that second year when it was a doubling course are now the, senior, uh, the seniors for whom you saw scores as juniors last year. And I've just got a few numbers to report on that. Okay, based on those numbers, when they entered um, Cape Elizabeth High School as ninth graders, I believe it was about 15% of the class, and the class was about 150 students, I, I think, um, that were not meeting standards. And uh, that was what we were expecting from year to year. Of course, the assessments have changed. We're using SATs now in place of MEAs, so it's hard to compare those eighth grade scores then to our 11th grade scores now. But still, I'm happy to report that out of the 25 students that Elaine and I had in two MLR classes that year, doubling with the part year math, of them, of those groups, 60% met standards last year out of the four levels, exceed, meets, partially meets, and does not meet, 60% met according to the uh, SAT resort results. 53% of that group partially met, which is really good, and only 8% of that group um, did not meet standards as 11th graders last year. As a whole class, it was only 2% of the 11th grade class as a whole that did not meet standards. And if we compare that to other schools throughout the state, there were very few schools in the one-digit percentages for does not meet. And we were the, the lowest um, of schools of significant size. So we feel as though we did right by those kids. That MLR class has evolved now over those last four years. Uh, now it's exclusively freshmen. Now it's a required course for those who are in Algebra Part 1. So it's taken as a pair. And those students give up a study hall during their freshman year to take the course. They actually find some good success there, and they feel good about themselves. They're doing wonderful solving of equations right now with two and three steps to them. They're doing word problems that require algebra to solve them. They're doing things that they never would have done if they had been in a tutorial as freshmen or as in sophomores. Courtney Farrell teaches the part one class. I teach the MLR class. Our classrooms are side by side and we communicate almost daily about individual students in our, our class of uh, 13 now that are in that doubling program. So those students have a good safety net for them. They have two enthusiastic teachers and we expect that they will do as well as the group that are graduating this year. 
another thing that my department looked at was how it was that we managed to do so much better in SATs than some similar schools uh, in Maine. And what we found out looking at those scores is that um, our lowest level kids did significantly better. So that we have very few kids, as I said, 2% in the does not meet. So that lower level, which in some schools is 30% does not meet and higher, um, we only have 2%. So they've jumped up into that next level, that next category. And likewise, we've done great things for the kids at the high end as well. Because whereas a lot of uh, schools have many, many kids in the meets category, the third level up, we have, I think, transported a lot of those kids into the exceeds category because we have 20% of our current senior class in the exceeds territory, and it's very rare to have double digits in that category. And I believe, again, aside from main school of math and science and some very small schools who might have had a few strong students, that we have the highest in the fourth category exceeds as well. So we feel as though we're doing a good job of boosting up the kids who struggle and also providing uh, excellent coursework for those who excel. Thank you. Hi, I'm Courtney Farrell. Um, one other thing I wanted to add to what Charlotte was saying is um, a lot of those kids also that started we, that would maybe at the, at the best meet, meet geometry their senior year, um, over half of the kids that started our program when we started are, are now in FST, which is two classes beyond geometry. They somewhere along the line doubled up and made it into FST. And one senior this year is an honors FST who started in MLR as a freshman. Um, and so I'm just here to give some thanks to some of the, the, the uh, reasons why I think our, our program has succeeded. And uh, one is actually to the students themselves. They have pretty much embraced the program. They don't complain. Um, I think they really like it and hear a lot of positive feedback from the kids themselves. Um, just about how much more confident they're becoming and they're really learning. They really, they love to do the problems on the board. They just go up there. Elaine was saying she saw the whole class up in Charlotte's room today, the whole entire class up there. And that's really, they have a lot of enthusiasm for doing math. It's really fun to see. Uh, we also want to thank the community and the school board for helping us by providing things that we really help us to get this stuff done, which is, uh, for one thing, common planning time, that we get to work together at the same time, the same period of the day. All the math, all the math teachers uh, sharing, like Charlotte said, working on, on individual kids, creating tests, aligning curriculum, things like that. Um, also summer work. We work in the summer. The uninterrupted time is really a crucial. Uh, just this past summer, Charlotte and Elaine worked on aligning the algebra curriculum with the Play-Doh software in the Achievement Center. So when a kid does need help on a specific topic, they can say, they can pinpoint the exact topic to send them there for. We can actually give a, a whole class an assignment. This is due Friday. Um, this topic, the quiz is coming up. They can go in on their own time and do it. That's been great, um, which also ties into the Achievement Center itself. We've all mentioned that. That really is a, has been a boon, um, very important for us. and. The last thing was, uh, oh, small class size. Um, with our most struggling kids, we try to keep them in a smaller class so we can get them the one-on-one -on -one help they need. And sometimes that comes as a sacrifice to the honors kids who would end up being in bigger classes. But um, we thank you for your support and all these things. It helps make our job easier. So thank you. So we're moving backwards. So we go backwards now yes. to um, update on the MSSA Legislative Committee. Uh, what I have sent to you is a packet. Uh, I now serve on the Maine Schools uh, Superintendents Association Legislative Committee for Cumberland County. Uh, it's an interesting committee because you get really involved in what's going on in the legislature. Since the legislature has just opened, uh, when we met last, it, things were just beginning to roll. If you've been watching the news recently, rolling has started to move even faster. So I want to talk just for a few minutes about some of the documents I sent to you in the beginning and then connect it to where things have gone since the governor's message last week. Uh, what I did is send you a packet. The first document is from the Maine School Superintendents Association. And what it is is a position paper on school consolidation 
regionalization, and collaboration. And that is the governor's plan. Pardon me? I just want to interrupt really quickly, Elaine and those, the other math teachers before you leave. It, that was very, very impressive. And as a math teacher, I'm, that, I'm blown away by all that you've accomplished. And I've had the privilege to work a little bit with Elaine on the Play-Doh software and see that in action. And what you all just said was just very impressive. So thank you. Sorry, I just had to That's okay. I'm glad you did that. Uh, so what you have is the, the position statement from Maine School Superintendents Association. As the message from the governor, we are beginning to hear that there was going to be a message uh, which would change the entire look of the public schools in Maine. Uh, if, you, if you read this report carefully and, and listened to what it had to say, it basically is a report that is not focusing on the loss of superintendents moving from many districts down to 26. It is more focused on what I think we all feel strongly about is how is this going to improve education for our young people? And so what you found on the second page is a series of questions that we feel were very important. And because we have not received answers or had none at that point, it was important to get these questions out. And those questions include, are there any new collaboratives or consolidated school administrative units should address how such a unit would improve student achievement, which is what we're all about. Schools are for improving student achievement. Efforts to support creating consolidation, regionalization, and collaboration initiatives should be considered carefully and thoughtfully and undertaken as a part of the comprehensive plan created by a broadly based state level commission and tested, piloted prior to final adoption. Uh, this obviously is one which will remain in the forefront as we watch the work that is going on in Augusta right now. The third one the commission described above should be charged with deve developing prototypical governance structures that could be used by regional collaboratives. It talks about the commission should identify law and rule changes uh, that currently inhibit and those that would facilitate the formation and governance of any jointly agreed upon collaborative uh, agreements. Any plan for a new collaborative or consolidated school administrative unit should address how the governance structure would provide for an efficient decision-making process. The governor and legislature must provide additional resources to adequately, adequately fund the efficient delivery of local and regional services funds to promote voluntary collaboratives and attain efficiencies of operations. The governor and legislature should uh, seriously consider instituting statewide and a regional collective bargaining for employees at school district levels. The governor and legislature should create dis uh, disincentives for communities acting to withdraw from CSDs and SADs. Throughout this process, flexibility and creativity must be encouraged. And finally, that the governor and legislature should direct similar efforts towards state, municipal, and county government. So in other words, instead of just looking at education, look at all, all parts of our state. A second document which I gave to you is from Maine School Board Association. It repeats some of the same questions that you just heard and reflects the fact that the Maine School Board Association is also very concerned, recognizing that the plan that is now in place would mean the demise of local school boards and the changes that would occur there. Since these came out, you obviously, I think I let you all know, you needed to listen to the governor's speech on Friday. Uh, several of you joined me today, uh, yes, today at the ATM Center to hear the uh, commissioner's statements. Tomorrow there will be an opportunity to get questions to the commissioner. What is happening now is there has been, an, they have opened the discussion about moving to 26 districts within the state. Those districts ranging from a district which had, would have 1,800 students to a district which we would be a part of which would have uh, 19,996 students uh, would mean 26 superintendents. It would also look at the changes as far as other administrative people, including uh, special ed directors and other people who work in those central offices. Uh, it, is a, it is a program that is moving very rapidly, as we heard today. Uh, the hope is to, their plan is to get it through the legislature this year and to move to July, where the initial work will begin so that they will open on, in September of 2008 with pro programs in place. 
What I have, am doing as of tomorrow morning is I'm working with Wendy and our local website to open up a site which will contain all of the documents that are coming out. The documents are coming fast and furious. I've been trying to keep you well informed. I know one that you were most thrilled with was to get the 500-page report on the governor's budget, uh, but I am making sure you have these. The word is very clear. As a superintendent in the state, and, one, and knowing that there will soon be only 26 superintendents, I am not going to stand up here and bring battle about the superintendency. My greater concern is what is going to happen to education. And it becomes very clear that it is the job of the school boards to gather the information, to know and understand the information, to be out there to speak against or in favor of what is going on at this point in time. It is also very important for our, our community to know, and that's why I want to be sure that uh, information gets out to them as quickly as possible. Uh, I know also that some of you would, will speak tonight to this issue and how we might move ahead as a school board in Cape Elizabeth in dealing with the issue. Dealing with the issue that says that Cape Elizabeth, if this happens, will be combined with South Portland, Portland and several other communities as you move north to become a district of, again, 19,996 students. So that uh, this is the beginning and it will move on from there. I did give to each of you today a map of the state that shows the 26 districts and their locations from the northern part of Arista County to, the, uh, to York County and then east and west as well. Also included in your packet is the first of many documents which will be coming out. My understanding is there are 2,500 bills which are now being typed for the legislature. Uh, as a member of this committee, we will be reviewing all of those bills, particularly those that focus on education or have a minor effect on education, because there can be both. One of them that I've put in here is one that says is an act to prepare all Maine students for college, work, and citizenship. It's a very important one for you to read. Several of you, from, uh, Jeff has mentioned it to me, along with several of you on the board, have read it and can see some things that are very different than the way Cape Elizabeth works at this point in time. This bill has not been assigned a number yet, but it is a bill that fits the uh, work that the commissioner has been doing over the last few years, uh, addresses uh, the high school end of education, and she is also addressing the other end of education the pre-five-year-old as well. But this is a really important one, and the reason I gave it to you early is just to give you an opportunity to begin to see some of these and begin to see what happens. On January 19th, I will be in a meeting uh, that will be looking at all of the bills that are coming out, and I'll be bringing that information back to you. Fortunately, Rebecca also is, serves on the legislative committee for the school board, and so we will be working together to make sure you're well informed. Uh, I believe there was one more document there. I just lost track. Okay, pursuing administrative efficiency for Maine schools, how our past can inform our current decisions. That is a, a, a newsletter that I gave to you from the University of Maine, and it's looking at, again, some of the work that has been done and questioning some of the decisions that are made right now or asking that they do a better job looking at it. Again, I provide that for you. You will find there will be a lot of reading to come in the next few months. There are reports out there. I've already mentioned to you before the uh, state school board's report. You also have had an opportunity to hear information about uh, the, um, just lost it, the report from the commission. I lost the name of it. It'll come back to me later. But anyway, those reports are out there. They are the basis of a lot of the information that's coming out now. So my sense is, the focus of the school board is going to change somewhat in the next few months as you begin to look at a change which can affect a lot of things including the future direction of the school. We are working on a future direction plan now which may look very different as we work through this process. So this is the first of many packets you will receive. This information will also go on the websites so that the community can read them as well. I know the newspapers are receiving uh, regular reports from the state. As a matter of fact, I had a newspaper reporter in today who brought me information I hadn't seen yet because it had come out so recently. But there, there is a challenge ahead. And I think as a board, uh, I know this board well enough to know you're willing to take on the challenge. 
and learn what is accurate information and where do we go from there. So that is kind of my quick report on the legislation that is coming down the road. Thank you. And, and I don't know if we, others want to we, comment at this point. Or? Kathy, may I comment? Yes, yeah. sure. Um, <clears throat> thanks to Alan's timely emails, we were able to download the reams of paper of this proposal from the governor. And I've had a chance to give it a cursory overview. And um, I just want to speak to this in public tonight, just to, in the hopes of raising some awareness um, at the board level and also at the community level. Um, first, I'd like to say that it's understandable the motivation trying to bring about education reform in Maine, given the strong anti-tax sentiments that we've been experiencing um, over the past number of years. And there is some strong logic to reducing the number of school districts. However, um, going from what our current number of school districts are to 26, and in the manner in which it's proposed, um, I find very disconcerting and I have a hard time um, initially supporting. From the perspective of Cape Elizabeth, I have significant concerns about the proposal and questions about how much we as a community will first save in taxes um, and also gain in educational programming. So if I may, I'm just going to list a couple of issues and then talk about um, what, how I would like to see the, 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 recommend to the board how we move forward. One, for a budget. As you may know, in Cape Elizabeth, we spend less per pupil than nearly all of the districts that have been grouped um, together uh, for the nearly 20,000 students. So the question begs, if we pay less per student than these other districts, Will we indeed save us, taxpayer, uh, Cape Elizabeth taxpayers, will we be saved money? Or will we actually be raising how much we pay for education as a community? Um, I suspect that we are going to be paying more. Two, our district will have 20,000 students. Others in Maine will have as low as 1,800. That really begs the question about how equitable is this proposal and does it really make a lot of sense? Two, three, I'm sorry. How does 20,000 students result in, as Alan has said, continuous improvement of student achievement, which is the stated goal of this proposal? Um, certainly, it defies what education um, thought that I've been reading from the various um, reports that we've been getting through magazines and reports and the like, that, cert that large districts like this perhaps may not result in improvement in student achievement. Lastly, savings. It says it will lower, so they're projecting $250 million savings in three years' time. And if you look at the numbers, it's really very questionable. And we have yet to see a detailed explanation about how that is going to happen. But one of the things that they say that they're going to do is lower the administrative money per student from EPS from 346 to 186. Um, as somebody who has spent a lot of time with budgeting, um, when you talk about putting 20,000 students together into one district with one superintendent, it's hard to imagine that you're not going to create the need for additional mid-level administrative positions. So I greatly question whether or not the, the, by them refusing to pay more than $186 per student administration, who is really going to be picking up the tab then to pay for the new mid-level um, supervision that's going to be required. Something that has not been mentioned by the press at this point is that in this document, it also says there's going to be savings of roughly $6 million from student teacher ratio, increasing student teacher ratios. And I think as we have seen tonight, what we are able to gain for, for specific um, target population in our schools, we benefit greatly from being able to have the flexibility to give those students some extra attention that is of great concern. The list goes on and on. The document 
um, does <laughs> it lists school the there's no longer going to be local school boards there will be a regional school board it lists its power as having authority over um, elementary education and they define that as kindergarten through eight there is no discussion that I can see of nine through twelve so who has that power and authority it also does not nearly go into the detail that we've been given about what school boards need to do um, for each district regarding curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. Who then is going to be reviewing curriculum? Is that all going to be at the state level? So there's a lot of questions that need to be um, asked and answered. So um, what I propose for uh, as a school board in Cape Elizabeth is that the finance committee begin the analysis and report regularly to the whole the school board as a whole. But obviously, we welcome everybody to come to these meetings to, to discuss what we're looking at. Um, and I urge all citizens of Cape Elizabeth and outside to really take a look at these documents, educate yourself, and ask questions of both our local legislators and our governor. Thank you. Anybody else like to? I would just like to add one comment. Um, what Alan was mentioning before, the bill and act to prepare all Maine students for college work and citizenship, I would also highly encourage everybody to read that carefully. There's one thing that just stood out to me, which is under heterogeneous grouping, the school must provide evidence that it has eliminated tracking and ability grouping of students as means of organizing students for learning or as a means of organizing the school's program of studies by the year 2009-2010. I just think that might be of interest to several parents. Anyone else? Yes, I, uh, I had the pleasure, because I did get a few chuckles out of it, of watching the ATM presentation by Commissioner Gendron. And it seems to me that my overall reaction was this is a matter of dumbing down Maine education to national standards. And um, you know, one of the issues spoken about was we, we allegedly have across the state um, an average of 12.6, I believe, students in a class versus the national average of 15.6. Uh, I, I suggest that we would be hard pressed to find a 12 student uh, teacher ratio in this district um, or an average like that in this district. Um, sounds like we're talking about uh, our southern states, um, and it's really scary. And as a as a business person, a long time business person, um, just looking at it, the numbers don't seem to add up to me. And Rebecca has already done a great job of articulating that, so I won't go any further. But it's this is a real concern. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Madam Chair? Yes. May I make a couple of general comments? Yes. My peers on the board were very distinct in talking about how this is going to affect the Cape Elizabeth school system, but I'd just like to remind the public in general that this plan basically is the state taking control of education. And about eight years ago, the state totally revamped the Department of Human Services. They made it a back to work program, or programs like Aspire, TANF. Pass, which is parents as scholars, and it was going to totally rebuild the human service system, lower cost, and drastically reduce the number of people on welfare. Eight years later, the Department of Human Services in the state of Maine is the largest employer in the state of Maine. It affects more people individually than the Department of Education as to who it touches and the funding that it needs. And the governor increased that budget by 15 percent in this year's budget. Another example I can give you is when the state takes control of something is year ago. And I said when I first got into the insurance business, I don't want the state managing my personal medical insurance because they can't do it. State of Maine is incapable of managing the way out of a paper bag and now they want to manage state education statewide. It's just flat and possible. They can't do it. The Department of Human Services doesn't even have the capability of balancing its own budget. They have a computer system they spent $58 million on, and they cannot balance their checkbook. They're going to totally throw it out this year and hire a new firm with a new system 
to try to come in to find out what their fiscal report is. They can't publish a fiscal report for the Department of Human Services. It's flat and possible. They have no idea. They don't know who they paid, how much they paid them, and how much is owed to them. And they're going to run education statewide. If I were a parent of younger children, thankfully my children are now young adults, if the state takes over education, I'd move because they don't have the capabilities of taking care of our children. And their past history has proven it. They don't have the management capabilities. And they will be unsuccessful if they try. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Actually, I do think there might be some example of um, this attempt in Vermont that I'm aware of, and I understand it has not um, been going well, and we might want to look into that. And I think I have a name of somebody that I that we can follow up with in case that person might be able to come and give us first-hand experience as to how consolidation has worked. You might know more about that than I do, Alan. I don't, but it would be interesting to look into, definitely. Okay. Um, Alan, back over to you. Okay. Uh, on the agenda this evening, there was an executive session at 6 o'clock, and the executive session set by state law was to discuss the spe specific duties of the superintendent. The purpose of that meeting is because I have recently found out that I am going to need open heart surgery and will be out of the system for a fairly extended amount of time and that will be occurring quite soon. And so the reason we met this evening was so that I could meet with the board to go over the agenda and planning for the school system while I am away. And we have done that and reviewed it and are ready to move ahead with that. Uh, my hope is based on what I've been getting from reports, et cetera, that I will be in the hospital within the next two weeks to have the surgery. I will be six to eight weeks uh, recovering from the surgery. Uh, as everybody has been giving me a hard time about, I intend to be as active as possible from home once I can stand up and do it. And, but anyway, uh, because this is a, a change in the school system and the work we go, that goes ahead, I've talked with several members of the school system who will be working to, to manage the pieces of the puzzle, anywhere from snow days, which are one of my favorite sets of days, and Sue Weatherby's gonna be handling that for me, uh, through any kind of disruption within the school system, uh, through the day-to-day -day routine of the school system, uh, the signing of documents, et cetera. But I think it's important for the public to know that this is going to be happening. I will be at a school Thursday for in-depth uh, studies, and again, hopefully we'll have the surgery within the next two weeks, and then move on from there. I think the only other point I want to make, because I've dealt with major illness one other time, is the fact that this was not an expected one. Uh, I didn't know a thing was wrong until the Friday night before Christmas. And so we've been moving fairly rapidly on it, but I think it's important for you and the public to understand that as, uh, as this process proceeds. So I did, this is the public notification of it. Uh, I did meet with the board I got information to the board last Friday and also met with the DLT at that point to let them know uh, what was happening. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, and I'm sure we all uh, wish you the best. Thank you. Um, moving on to unfinished business. Uh, policies for second reading. Uh, I guess we we'll turn it over to you, Trish. Yeah, there are three policies that um, are here for second reading. Um, policy DF fundraising, um, well, fundraising administrative procedures, which is DFR, um, and policy CHD, which is administration policy absence. These were all um, presented for first reading in December. There were also two other policies that were presented at that time, but as the policy committee has not met to discuss them, they were sent back to the policy committee. These are the only three that are presented for second reading this evening. Um, so. I would make a motion that we approve policy DF, um, DFR, Administrative Procedures for Fundraising, and policy CHD, Administration and Policy Absence. Second. Thank you, Kevin. Um, discussion? No, no discussion? <laughs> no, we're just arguing over who got the second. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK. Great. Um, <coughs> all those in favor? None opposed? 7-0. Um, moving to new business, uh, consideration of superintendent's recommendation for athletic fee positions for winter 2007. I have uh, two 
One is from uh, Cape Elizabeth High School for winter coaching. The first one is Terry Long, who would be the Alpine ski coach for 232 hours. It's a level three position, and this is paid for by the boosters. Uh, the second one is Cade Blackburn, girls ice hockey coach. It is a level three and is paid for by the boosters. The third one is Richard Churchill, assistant Alpine ski coach, 118 hours, the level three and paid by the boosters. And those are the high school ones. Is there a motion? At this time, I'd like to make a motion to accept the superintendent's recommendations for the athletic fee positions as described. Second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? No? All those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. From the middle school, I have one that is David Reed, who will be the middle school boys expansion basketball coach for 120 hours. He is at a level two, and he is paid for by the system. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the superintendent's recommendation for the middle school boys expansion basketball coach. Thank you. Second? Thanks, Trish. Discussion? Question? Yes. Uh, middle school boys expansion basketball, is that new? Is, what is that? I'm not sure. That, is it new as no, far as you no. know? It's always in the budget. Yeah. It's just if they have more boys than... It's okay. the number that are playing. It's the number. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Any other questions? All those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. And I have one last one. Uh, which is from the high school, okay. uh, is the co-curricular fee recommendation for Larry Allen to be the director of musical. Is that yours? Is it, which school is that? It's a high school. It's a high school, okay. Larry Allen, director that's re of the That's actually replacing, it was approved for Dick Mullen last month, and that was an error. So okay. this is replacing the one that was approved last month for okay, Dick Mullen. Okay, very good. I'd like to move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation for the co-curricular fee position as described. Thank you. Second? Trish? Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? 7-0. And the last one on this is a consideration of a letter for a staff member regarding retirement. And I spoke to you earlier. I would ask you to pull that from your packets at this point in time. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I missed one. Uh, so I'll take care of the retirement one if that's okay. Pull that from your packets that will not be acted on this time. I need to back up. Uh, we had a request regarding high school field trips. Uh, one of the pieces to that puzzle is when they are field trips, we are need to set up a form that they complete to show everything that is going to be happening. I have that report, which I just got today from Gretchen, and so it's why you're getting it right now for the trips that she is talking about. From this point on, uh, we do have a field trip form that Mary will be sending out to them when they're requesting it so they can provide all of the information. Did everyone get one down there? Okay. Uh, this is uh, Gretchen McNulty who is requesting from the high school. This is a approval for planned and anticipated in and out of state field requiring overnight stay for speech and debate as well as for World Affairs Council. What you will see is uh, the first two are speech and debate request for one overnight stay in state and as you see she lists the event the location the date and all of the pieces including lodging and etc there is a second one a request for four to five nights stay out of state and that's an anticipated one based upon their performance in the one for the state so she's also getting this in here in case we have to do that and i'm correct on that am i jeff yes on the second page you have the world council uh, going to the model un it's a request for a two-night stay out of state. Uh, the second one is a request for a three-night stay out of state. And the fourth one is for a three-night stay out of state. Uh, again, uh, I'm assuming that this is based on what they have for accommodations for them, or are there sta steps in the puzzle, Jeff? Do you know? Yes. OK. Because I noticed the first one's in Cambridge, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. the second one's in Ithaca, New York, and the third one is in Ithaca. So, so I think you're right. It's, it's the stages and what, how we do in each of those competitions. I think I checked this this afternoon after Gretchen did give it to me. I think she's provided all the information you were looking for. Uh, and 
Uh, I would uh, recommend you approve these. Would anyone like to make a motion? I move that we approve the requests for the two um, field trips, speech and debate, and World Affairs Council Model UN um, as presented this evening. You? Is there a second? Yeah. second. There's three seconds. That's good. Oh, <laughs> um, any discussion, questions? Okay. Um, take a vote. All in favor? Opposed? 7 0. Okay. At this time, I'd like to take care of uh, some new business regarding our uh, executive session prior to the meeting tonight. This time, I'd like to make a motion that we allow the transfer of 35 days sick leave from a former employer for Superintendent Alan Hawkins to cover a part of his uh, recovery. Is there a second? Second. Okay. A discussion? Questions? All in favor? Opposed? 7 0. Thank you. Moving on to committee reports. Uh, Finance Committee. Rebecca? Okay. We met on December 19th at the um, Allen's office. Attending were myself, Kevin, Willinda as committee members. Others present was Alan, Pauline, Karen, Maureen O'Mara, the town planner, and Ward Peck, the editor of the Century. We signed warrants. Then Maureen, well, or during, Maureen O'Mara um, updated the committee regarding the status of the town's comprehensive plan and the need for improved enrollment forecasts. Maureen suggested that utilizing planning decisions again with adjustments to the previous model would provide the strongest estimates. Possible adjustments could include not over-relying on the number of building permits and allowing for the impact of home sales or immigration. Acknowledging our uh, school system's tight financial situation and the fact that both the municipality or as part of the comprehensive plan and the schools would utilize the forecast, I suggested that um, we explore a cost-sharing arrangement with Mike McGovern and Alan. Uh, first is getting an estimate from planning decisions and then plans on speaking with Mike. The energy report was reviewed and nothing was um, exceptionally um, special. We were just on track. We're benefiting, obviously, from some warm weather, although us parents would appreciate maybe a little bit of snow. Um, the food service report was reviewed. Pauline explained that she believes the problems with the email notification program may be the source of the rise in negative student accounts. Gary Lenoy uh, was helping to fix the problems, and I believe we all hopefully did receive emails. I know I did, giving me my balance. Additionally, the committee noted that the revenue in November was significantly lower this year than last year by $22,000 and ask Pauline to look um, into the number of meals sold to get a better idea of what is happening, and we'll get an update on that next month, next meeting. We did discuss um, targeted funds under EPS. Uh, Alan has reported that the state has yet to define for schools specifically what the composition of these targeted funds are, hence making it very difficult to know whether or not we're meeting our targets. I think that they um, are going to try to give us our best estimate um, how, as how we're doing. Some areas that there are targeted is technology. Um, early education. And early education. Um, the next finance committee will be held Wednesday, January 24th at 8.30 in the superintendent's office. Thank you, Rebecca. Policy committee, Trish. Uh, the policy committee did not meet in December, so um, we, we meet next Tuesday. We will um, review the policies I referred to before, CA and CB, which were sent back to us along with other agenda items. Thank you, Trish. Communications, Trish? Uh, the communications committee met on December 13th. We discussed um, professional development reporting and the information sharing that's on the school website and ways to make that more effective and efficient. We also discussed um, the upcoming budget process and ways to communicate information with all the district stakeholders, sort of um, perhaps improve um, on the process from last year and work with the Finance Committee. Our next meeting is Monday, February 12th. Thank you. Personnel, Linda? 
Uh, personnel committee has not met since our last meeting, but we are scheduled to meet next Thursday morning at 8 a.m. in the William Jordan Conference Room. Thank you, Linda. Strategic Planning Committee, Trish. Uh, we have not met since our last meeting. We are meeting this Friday um, to really review and finalize details for the January 26th workshop, the Community Day. Um, and a reminder to all community members and parents association and anyone else who got an invitation to that day, it's, we'd love to have you there. It's important that we hear all voices. So if you did get an invitation, this is a gentle nudge to respond. <laughs> We need your RSVP whether you're going to be able to make it or not. So if you could do that, we'd really love to have you there. Thank you. Uh, student Extracurricular Committee, Linda. Uh, yes, the Student Extracurricular Committee had their committee meeting actually just on January 2nd. Um, most of the meeting discussion was around the kids' turf and the turf field. Um, based on a lot of discussion that took place actually on December 18th when members of the committee as well as representatives from the town, um, both on the municipal side, the town planner, the town manager, as well as um, members from the Kids Turf Committee were there to provide us with an update on where the project stood. Um, they presented us with three of the, some, an outline of three proposals that they were working with at that time from three different vendors for different surface materials, as well as what was included in uh, their proposed prices. Um, a lot of questions were asked at the meeting, a lot of questions were answered at the meeting, and a lot of questions came out after the meeting. Uh, so our meeting on the 2nd of January dealt with some of the outstanding issues that those of us on the committee still had. Um, I forwarded a lot of the questions on to uh, kids turf and they responded to them very succinctly and we were able to qualm most of everybody's concerns. Um, there were some detailed minutes that went out that I'd be happy to provide to anybody who actually wanted, wants them. Uh, we do have another committee meeting coming up on January 22nd at 3, 3 o'clock in the Jordan Conference Room. Thank you, Linda. Kathy, I'm yes. sorry, can we, we should probably report on wellness. Oh, wellness committee. Yes, you should. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, thank it's you. Okay. It's a new one, so we probably need to be included next time. Um, wellness committee, um, as it stands right now, is just Alan and three board members, myself, Peter, and Karen. We met, I can't remember the day. Aha, uh -huh. the 4th of January to discuss um, the further makeup of the committee. And um, Alan is uh, sending inv has sent invitation out to staff and to other community members, and we are also looking for some public uh, involvement. And uh, there will be a piece in the courier as to how to contact Alan, and um, there will be some information on the website. But we will invite anyone to contact Alan if you're interested in serving on the committee. If I could just add to that probably would be wise to contact me or Mary since I may not be there just to be sure that information gets in. Thank you. Is there a next schedule? There meeting? is. I'm sorry. Thank you. There is another meeting scheduled for the 23rd of January at 8 o'clock. Um, 8 a.m.? In the morning. That's correct. In the superintendent's office. That's okay. I just asked because there's a meeting that night maybe. Would you like to comment yes. on that? Yes. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention when I was going over the uh, plan for me not being here is the lovely green, uh, aren't, yeah, green sheets that say January 23rd meeting on the budget. Uh, based on what my schedule will be, I may not be able to do that. So I, as I talked with the board tonight, I will try to get a meeting in if I'm not here on the 23rd prior to leaving just to go over the initial budget which has been done in the past, just to give you some idea of where we are. Uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, we have met with all the DLT members. Uh, Pauline now has the budget. She and I met today to go over it. Uh, she is in the process of beginning to put it together, but it takes at least three weeks to get everything in place. So we'll do a, an overview of it uh, prior to the February 27th meeting. And I'll try to do it the end of January or as soon as I can if we need to do that just to give you an overview. 
Thank you, Alan. Uh, Kevin, anything on paths? Yeah, we met last month to finalize the budget. I presented it to all of the members of the General Advisory Committee. Um, I think as part of the fact that there was a 0% increase, um, it was unanimously approved by all of the representatives. I brought it back, but because I was sick, I couldn't prepare the report for Rebecca and then the, rest, the full board. So we'll deal with that next month. Um, I, I am, well, I guess pleased, although it indicates a decrease in enrollment for us, that our figure is under $4,000 for the Part 2 budget, which is new equipment and things like that. And there'll be a corresponding uh, decrease in our Part 1 cost, which is the overall cost of running the, uh, the pass portion of the school over there, but not Casco Bay High School. That's it. That's it. Um, we won't be meeting again uh, for another month or so um, because at this point, each individual school board has to now in turn ratify um, the budget and we need to have a unanimous ratification of the budget, uh, unfortunately, due to the uh, bylaws. So we'll see. And we'll handle our piece of it in March. Thank you, Kevin. Well, February, February, I guess. February, yes. Okay. Um, technology Committee, Linda? The uh, Technology Planning Committee met on December 20th. Uh, we were presented with a draft of the preamble uh, presented by Jay Sherma of the Thomas Memorial Library that is really promoting the one-town philosophy on, for our new technology plan. Most of our discussion that day was around the seven goals that are set up in the new technology plan. And we're basing ours a lot on the National Education Technology Plan, but we're putting our own label on it, believe me. Uh, we, we have found um, a few of the action steps involved with the goals is overlapping. Uh, there are some of the goals and some of the action steps that the national plan calls for that we here in Cape Elizabeth already do. And so we're looking to expand some of those goals and um, one of the one major topic of discussion that took up uh, quite a bit of time that was actually very worthwhile was a lot of it had to do with the training of all the individuals town-wide rather they were in the school districts or in the town or in the libraries that training is probably one of the biggest areas we need to focus a lot of our attention on um, training on the existing technology that we have and being uh, being assured that we can train individuals to use the, any technology that we have coming at us in the future so that we're taking advantage of, of all the technology that we have available to us. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for January 17th in, uh, at 2.30 in the Jordan Conference Room. Thank you. Um, Yes. May I ask a mm -hmm. question? Yes. Um, just it came up today in the middle school parent association meeting. Um, just a curiosity about the if there's any type of um, monitoring of the social and emotional impact of the current use of technology and future future use of technology. So I don't know if that's one of the things you're mm -hmm. going to be discussing. But if it is, I think there are parents that are interested in learning about mm -hmm. those results or interested in finding out what those impacts are. Right. Right now. The focus of the committee is um, we're required by the state to file a new technology plan okay. where we plan on taking our technology for the next five okay. years. So, so that's, really that's the primary the focus of okay. the committee right now, but sounds interesting anyway. Sure. Okay. Um, Linda, I'm sorry, when was that next technology meeting? It's uh, January 17th. At 2.30. Where? Jordan Conference Room. Thank you. Okay, um, the next item is public comment on agenda items. Seeing none, uh, I will move on to school board agenda requests. Does anybody have a request for the school board agenda for next month? Not that you can't throw that in later on, just asking now. Uh, now announcements of upcoming meetings. There is a school board executive session on January 10th at 345 in the William Jordan Conference Room to discuss a student issue as provided by 1 MRSA section 405 6B. There's a policy committee meeting Tuesday, January 16th at 12 noon in the Jordan Conference Room. 
There's a Sports Done Right meeting Thursday, January 18th from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Community Center. The Strategic Planning Committee meets Friday, January 12th at 1245 in the Superintendent's Office. Personnel Committee will meet Thursday, January 18th at 8 a.m. in the Jordan Conference Room. Technology Committee will meet January 17th at 2.30 p.m. in the Jordan Conference Room. Finance Committee meeting will be Wednesday, January 24th at 8 a.m. in the Superintendent's Office. The School Board Workshop is scheduled for Tuesday, January 23rd at 7 p.m. in the High School Library. The Wellness Committee will be meeting January 23rd at 8 a.m. in the Superintendent's Office. Student Extracurricular Committee meets January 22nd from 3 to 4 p.m. in the Jordan Conference Room. I guess, oh, Strategic Planning Workshop, sorry, is Friday, January 26th from 8 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. in the high school cafeteria. And the next school board business meeting is Tuesday, February 13th at 7 p.m. in council chambers. Have I missed one? Communications on Monday, February 12th. At what time? 3.05, on Cove Media Center. On Cove Media Center? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody, anything else missed? No? Any other business? Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. Thank you very much. You can't.